Hi everyone, welcome back to Visual Narratives Online, and yeah, so how's everyone doing? I hope everyone had a relaxing weekend of holidays, whichever one you celebrated, whether it's uh, Easter or Passover or just uh, running around chasing random bunnies for their eggs. I don't know how that works. Uh, so, uh, this week I have the syllabus up here, and I'm afraid I'm... I'm not afraid. I don't care. <laughs> it's, it's all still going to be relevant. It's just I'm enacting kind of a radical change uh, with regard to what I was going to do this week, which was children's narratives. And um, I had a bunch of stuff lined up that was kind of uh, a lot of like video montages of things and wanted to rely on a lot of back and forth in the discussion of... Uh, a lot of the children's narrative information that I had gathered together it wasn't a lot of slides, there was a lot of just random things that uh, I wanted to sort of get your personal perspectives on mass, live audience, uh, with regard to generating a, a kind of a more personal discussion about how children's narratives affected you um, and that role in, in visual narrative and, and visual culture, uh, as opposed to myself, who's considerably older. So if I just did a recording here and came at it exclusively from my perspective, a lot of you would just be like, huh, well, I never saw that, so that doesn't really have any particular impact on me. So I didn't want to do it from a first-person perspective. So I changed up kind of everything. <laughs> um, it, there is going to be... Uh, kind of an element of children's juvenile sort of narrative, but not really, and I'll get to that at the end, and that's actually for you to add to the discussion board. So right now, as I've been doing normally, I am going to uh, read some excerpts from the discussion board with regard to uh, the responses to uh, the 2D to 3D or graphic novels and mangas and comics to uh, full-blown feature films and how those things translated. And I gave you a list of 15, and uh, people made some really cool choices. There was uh, a lot of Akira on there, which uh, is awesome. Like, I'm, I'm actually really glad, because sometimes I'll do these classes, like illustration survey and such, and I'll bring up Akira, and um, maybe half or maybe more than half or just like oh what's Akira and I'm just like oh my god um, but a lot of you um, paid a lot of attention to that it's a very seminal project in terms of uh, animated films and also um, translating a manga to uh, an anime so there was a lot of that um, what there wasn't which I'm kind of not surprised I didn't see American Splendor on there um, I have a list over here uh, I didn't see Old Boy Although I do recommend that. Uh, it's very disturbing, but it's really good. Um, I didn't see uh, The Crow. That's kind of old. It's a little bit dated, but still really good. Brandon Lee was great. And I don't think, I don't, yeah, I didn't see any V for Vendetta either, which is a little surprising because that's kind of up there with Watchmen as far as one of those, uh, you know, seminal comic to, to film projects that are a little more serious and, and, and not uh, mainstream. Um, what I was kind of, I was surprised to see uh, Edge of Tomorrow, and I know it's kind of weird, but it doesn't really fit into our whole, you know, artsy aesthetic because it's a Tom Cruise-driven picture. But I rewatched it just the other night, and it still it holds up really well. It's it's a, it's a really good film, and um, a couple of Hellboys, um, some Snowpiercers, um, only one Ghost in the Shell, which I was a little surprised considering the amount of uh, attention to Akira, uh, some Watchmen. Um, oh, and no Persepolis either, which I really, really do recommend. That I mean, that's that's a beautiful uh, film. It's a beautiful comic. It's it's extremely well done. Uh, a bunch of kick asses, which is great. Um, so there was a, a good measured, like broad response here. So rather than go through all fifteen and read response for everyone, because I don't just take way too long, uh, I'm gonna go like halfway and do uh, seven of them. There's gonna there's six, and there's, actually there's one bonus because. A couple of people went off book with my permission. They emailed me. One of them was having a hard time getting through Kick-Ass. Um, was a little bothered by the Dave's character, so wanted to choose something else. And then another person 
um, also ask permission to go off book and um, I'll, I'll tell you what that is. I'll do that one last. So let's start off with a little reading from a response to Akira and the, the title, the student titled this thread, Kaneda! Of course. So, uh, <laughs> but by the way, and you know, I find that hilarious all the time because now this film came out in 1988 and actually later that year is when I saw it uh, on VHS, of course. Um, and that was the original dub uh, into English and the the fun that we poke at the dialogue of Akira is based on that original English dub and how we sort of poke fun at uh, overdub uh, manga, I'm sorry, anime dialogue in general stems from that first classical English dub of Akira. Uh, it, it's since been redubbed and to me it's fine because it's it, it makes it a little more serious, I suppose, but at the same time, it's missing that charm of that funny, strange, and uh, anachronistic uh, dub that first time around in 88. So let's see what paragraph was I going to read here of this one. Um, yeah. Okay, so this student's commenting on Akira. Not everything is a perfect translation, however. The manga is several chapters and volumes long, and a movie can only have so long a runtime. As a result, very much the little, the, excuse me, the middle portion of the story is cut. Several side plots, characters, and scenes are not present in the movie, and if they are, their screen time is greatly reduced. It would be sort of like if Lord of the Rings movies had no two towers and the Fellowship made it from Rivendell to Mordor off screen. This person knows me really well. <laughs> you know how to write to me. While this change does fundamentally alter the story from manga to film, the film does a very good job working with that material that they could keep. The end result is two pieces of media that fundamentally tell the same story but feel too very different in execution. Now, this is more of a narrative analysis than a visual analysis, but, but I found that out of this particular piece of writing here um, to be uh, very on point. Um, so that's the way I've been uh, choosing to, to read these responses. And, you know, it can be narrative, it can be visual. Uh, I would point out which. Uh, the next response, this is really tiny types. So I have to look up a little bit. Um, is about Hellboy. Um, this is actually a, a first-time uh, comic reader, so they were familiar with the film, but they were not as familiar with the comic. So that's kind of a neat take. They they went back to the comic and saw, uh, you know, the Mike Mignola's style, um, and kind of reconciling that with the the film. Um, so let's see, paragraphs two and three. Uh, some of the big differences are more in the actual plot of the story, but the movie kind of follows the comic, but not really. It hits the big pieces. I like how Hellboy was taken in by Broom and the Wizard Guy and the Seven Gods of Chaos and the bit about the adventuring in the ice caps up north, but the movie seems to take place in the city, and granted, I only read some of the only some of the comics, but they seem to take place all over. There's nothing about the cabin dishes or their sinking house, nothing about the frog monster, and the movie doesn't get the beginning right either, where uh, Hellboy is summoned to Earth. This is understandable, though. Hollywood has to make decisions about what to keep and what to cut. I did notice a lot of the same icons and imagery, uh, particularly the statue of the crucified Jesus in the movie right at the beginning. It came right out of the comic looking almost identical. And there's a line about the army guy never having seen, uh, excuse me, heard the word paranormal before. And that line is pretty much straight from the comic as well. I think there's a bit of a gap between the movie and the comic, but it's not a bad one. The gap does not ruin the movie or discredit the comic. It's a necessary gap. There are just some things that look better in comics than movies and vice versa. I will likely to continue to read the comic series as I like the stylization very much. Mike Mignola, telling you. The hard edges and blocks of color juxtaposed against big spots of black shapes and shadows is appealing, and I find the script to be well written as well. So, yeah, the some of the... So this is a bit of a narrative analysis with some visual analysis sewn in there too, so some of the, the literal iconography you're getting pulled uh, from the comic showing up in the movie, and here's somebody who's not that familiar with the comic, but right away saw some familiarity there, so, you know, that's, that's kind of neat um, how that just kind of popped up and it was instantly recognizable in that way. Uh, let's see here, do, 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 do. yes, so Ghost in the Shell. Uh, this student writes, 
Oh, uh, they predicate their uh, comparison with this little caveat. I guess this is to all of you, not to me, because I've already watched it plenty of times. If you haven't yet, please watch Ghost in the Shell, the 1995 anime, by the way. Not that shitty live-action remake. I, I totally with you there. Watch the second one, too. Not only are they gorgeously animated, but if you love sci-fi, it really attacks the concept of man slash machines so well. The manga, though, mm, I wouldn't recommend it beyond getting a bit more world-building into it. So they definitely have an opinion about the manga. So let's read about uh, what that is. Uh, the manga is remarkably different. Most notably, Makoto is very expressive. She makes silly faces, jokes with her cohorts, and is prone to hot-headedness. Bateau as well. He functions as a comic relief a good chunk of the time. Uh, more of Makoto's manly bro than the calm, collected point of logic and conscience uh, that he acts as a foil uh, to Makoto's vigilante impulses, like in the movie. Uh, furthermore, the style of the manga is curious. It's almost a perfect blend of Japanese and American comic styling. For one thing, it reads left to right instead of the opposite, which is typical for manga. The faces and expressions are very manga typical. Big eyes, wide mouths, but little detail in the teeth. Uh, cheapification of characters, over-the-top silliness, style changes to less detail in the moments of comic relief. But sound effects and the methods in which certain characters are drawn, like businessmen or government officials, are very American in style. Manga is so distinct in this manner that it almost feels like you're reading the wrong thing. Is this the same Ghost in the Shell? The feeling of disparity between man and machine feels like an afterthought in the manga, whereas it was the driving force in the anime. So, that's an interesting point. Um, I think one of the things that I, I can draw from reading that is that uh, the manga does go through these you know, typical manga iterative process of stylization to discern humor, and seriousness and action and, and the style kind of uh, changes accordingly. Um, in the anime, uh, the style is, is very solid. It's that kind of interesting blend of CGI and traditional uh, anime. And um, it's very consistent throughout. I think there are some moments where you see a little bit more CGI uh, action uh, and some like the more dreamier, more biomech kind of uh, sequences, but I think that has more to do um, with what you're actually seeing on the screen, the composition of what the the details of the material are or is on the screen as opposed to uh, changing the narrative radically in any way, whereas it seems to change the narrative radically in the manga. So that's kind of a, a, an interesting cross-comparison there. Da, 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 da. Uh, okay, and 300. Actually, surprised to get one of these. Oh yeah, No Sin City. And I, I, from my perspective, I guess, I always felt that Sin City was the more um, popular of the two in the sense of um, you know, box office, I suppose, but uh, didn't see that on here. Instead, I've got a response for 300 and uh, let's see, paragraphs to four. So, um, first thing I noticed about the film and the graphic novel is similarity between color palettes. Both were limited and desaturated, save for red and gold spot colors. It didn't take me long to make a connection between red being Sparta and gold being Persia. In several scenes, the palette was nearly monochromatic, save for these two colors. And especially in the film, I noticed that everything to do with Persia was gold, from the fires they set, to the haze over the destroyed village, to the overwhelming sun silhouetting Leonidas. And of course, the coins used to bribe the priests in the film um, were bright, shiny, condemning gold. Well, I like that adjective. <laughs> the red of the Spartan's cape is also used to denote alignment, and over the course of both the film and the graphic novel, we see the capes torn and red blood everywhere, and this helps nail down the symbolism of one of the final shots showing the bodies of the Spartans, red cloth and red blood on overwhelming gold sand, showing that even though the 300 died, they achieved victory. Uh, as a result, both visuals are cohesive, clearly related, and clearly telling the same story with the same feel, one of victory, sacrifice, Sacrifice and overwhelming testosterone. <laughs> I like that. We'll finish there, and that's that's absolutely true. So um, that's a great combo of of uh, narrative and formal uh, visual analyses, and how it drives uh, the narrative. And it drives the narrative very similarly in the comic as well as the film, just relying on that, that 
very specific color. And it's it's very similar to Sin City, which is another Frank Miller adaptation to uh, to a film, whereas that that was extremely noir, extremely black and white, and that was something that uh, wanted to be uh, they wanted to put into the film to make it read in the exact same way. And there's some spot colors in, in some of the stories, um, but it's the same kind of thing here. So I think with the success of that, uh, doing 300 in the same way with a little more color. Uh, and more action, and also you know different kind of lighting, but uh, again trying to mimic what was in the comic, and that seemed to be very successful. Okay, uh, we have a reading of Snowpiercer, which is here someplace. Yes, um, little short thing here. Uh, both the comic and the film create a look that feels like it's stylistically 1950s or so. For example, one of the wealthy women in the comics has hair that flips up in uh, mid-20th century poofy style. The main wealthy woman character in the film also has hair that is poofy and intentionally pinned up with big glasses, which also gives a mid-1900s look. The overall look is a combination of decades, because while there are some old-fashioned clothes, the technology looks more contemporary. This is true for the movie. But the comic book does not show this as much uh, this much contrast between old clothes and new tech. It's possible the comic mill felt more futuristic when it was made in the 1980s, but now it feels a bit dated. And um, I'm reading this particular one because I, I like that that last point of um, something done in a time where it at the time in which it's done it kind of feels advanced, um, but then it seems kind of dated, uh, especially when you look at it in retrospect to something that's made similar to it, like a movie version of it in a contemporary age, and you're sort of like able to do that and able to sort of discern like what's going to look like futuristic slash dystopian tech, um, and also, you know, the tropes of, uh, you know, mid 20th century uh, fashion and things of that nature. Um, there's also a lot of Art Deco in that movie, too. I know it's a lot of, um, you know, architecture that resembles that, especially towards the front of the train. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, I'm, I'm sorry, you don't know what I'm talking about, but, um, yeah, so I think that's, that's great. And, and another film, just real quick, because it's on my mind, um, that looks dated because of the tech, but at the same time, you kind of, it's almost like you give it a little bit of a pass. This is the first Alien film is that the computers are all, you know, just, just like vector graphic uh, screens. They're like tiny little screens with like huge, um, you know, embedded in like these huge uh, computer modules. And um, it seems very dated, but at the same time, um, you kind of feel like, okay, this is not the future. It's kind of like an alternate future, um, different timeline, you know, it... It's interesting just the way it plays. It can play out in a film a little bit differently than it can uh, in print. Okay. Um, oh, so this person titled. They were very, very excited to do this because they titled their uh, little analysis here "Best Comic Ever." Click to find out what. So I took the clickbait and found out that their favorite is Tank Girl. <laughs> Which is great. I love the enthusiasm in this. So, uh, going on paragraph three. Uh, the world Jamie Hewlett created for Tank Girl and all of her badassery to occupy uh, that world does nothing but perfect justice to her. It's a world filled with extreme gestures, high saturation, uh, once they updated the original black and white comics, and an abundance of offbeat media. Hewlett rendered the story so well that it became important to the current social movements of its time. Tank Girl empowered women in punk culture who were facing oppression for their sexuality and lifestyle by celebrating the things that they did. In addition to standing up for the underdogs, it's a visual gem to look at. The characters are all filled with life throughout expressions, gestures, and style. Hewlett's artistic mediums of ink with collage elements carries the characters through psychedelic and surreal events that are exciting both to read and see. Film makes up for not being uh, drawn and not animated, as it probably should have been, by utilizing the highly saturated clothing, accessories, and background props. While it gains points for this, it loses points for using the costuming and design that it did for the Rippers, which were the mutant kangaroos. Uh, the film, and if you see it, you'll, you'll see what uh, we're talking about here. 
The film also gets to achieve something spectacular of its own, uh, where it has a perfect soundtrack assembled by the infamous uh, Courtney Love herself. Um, the soundtrack holds nothing but alternative rock that gives more grunge and thrill to the whole film. So uh, I like the fact that you mentioned the, the music sort of in, in enhancing the visuals there, and it, and it definitely does. Um, I think Tank Girl is a really good one to sort of look at. I think the film, uh, personally, because I, I, this person is a huge fan of both for, for different reasons, and that's great. I think the film and the, the comics kind of operate in sort of separate universes in, in the stylistic sense, is that uh, the film just kind of took on a real sort of B-movie kind of status, almost purposefully, uh, because I don't think they necessarily had the tech at the time, um, nor maybe even the storytelling wherewithal that Hewlett had to be able to sort of pull that kind of thing off, because the, the stories in Tank Girl, they kind of they jumped all around from comic to comic. They're just like short form stories that were set in, in a particular world, a particular character, but she always looked different. Um, her behavior was always consistent, but that's uh, hence all the costume changes in the film. But the film had to sort of have a, you know, kind of a driving narrative throughout, whereas the comics could jump around because they were kind of crazy in terms of their look. So it was easy to allow it to jump around narratively as well. Whereas the film, couldn't do that, at least at the time, nobody thought to try that, and um, even though the visuals in, in the soundtrack kind of drove the attitude of the film, which was maybe the best part, it, it didn't really drive the narrative particularly well. Okay, and right, we have a, a kick-ass review. Uh-huh. I am having little Wi-Fi problems. I've been having that quite a bit lately, actually. Um, probably because too many people in the house are using it all at once. Um, so, let's see, which part am I reading here? So this person approaches Kick-Ass from a, a pretty personal perspective, which is great. Um, just, just wanted to predicate with that because of some of the, the wording in here. Um, it's a little weird reflecting on these comics. Um, oh wait, what am I reading the right paragraph here? Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to start here. Uh, the movies and graphic novels are incredibly different, not only in visual style but allegory and context. Where the graphic novels paint a picture of redemptive violence while duly poking fun at the idea of mass vigilantes, the movies seem to portray teenagers in special circumstances. The comic is incredibly graphic, more so than the movies, as the novel tends to freeze on images of mutilation and violence, whereas the movie flashes through them to the end of the scene. That difference between the imagery of violence is symbolic of the difference in artistic approaches. I would argue that the novel may be less of a narrative than the movie. The movie's objective is to use scenes to differentiate a plot which leads to a thesis of meaning, either it be a conclusion or a value. The novel, and at the Asian life experience I was at at the time, felt hardly like a narrative and more of an exploration into a world different than mine. When watching the movies, I often saw the distinct nature of chronological order, whereas in the comics, my sense, uh, in my senses were more descriptive. So, I like this because it touches upon a couple of different things. Um, for one, uh, I like the fact that, you know, it, it, it was similar to what I was just saying about Tank Girl in the sense that, you know, the movie had to sort of follow a through line uh, whereas the comics could kind of jump around a bit, um, and they were more, uh, or they were less expositional, and they were more about, like, just being in the moment, um, and kind of expressing itself through those moments, whereas the movies, there was a definitive sort of, you know, plot, so, you know, the protagonists, the team-up, the antagonists, the fights, and all that stuff that kind of go through to the end, um, and this also points up something that I was just talking with somebody about this the other day, um, that when we read, we read at our own pace. So, but when we see a film or a movie or a TV show, we're at the, the pace of the director. However they filmed it, however they want to throw things out sequentially, it's like we have to receive it in the order in which it is shown and the speed at which it is shown as well. So I always like to use the example of um, spoilers, I guess, uh, the Red Wedding in Game of Thrones, um, if 
those of you who don't know it or don't remember it or whatever, you probably should remember it because it's pretty shocking. It's like we're a large member of a large constituency of the the, the cast of the members of this one particular family in the film. Uh, all gets they all get kind of killed at the same time in a surprise kind of action uh, by you know an, another set of uh, players, another family. Um, they get basically get trapped in a in a like a wedding reception and then they kind of get killed off and very quickly and very violently and kind of unexpectedly if you hadn't read the books um, and the thing is is that if you did read the books well you kind of saw that coming but the way in which you read that in the books you can read that at your own pace so then when so-and-so gets their throat cut and is like lying in a pool of their own blood and you just you can just be like whoa and then you can just kind of stop and back away from it and go, oh man, okay, I'm like letting that sink in, like what's next? But in the film, it's like this person gets their throat cut and this person gets shot with the crossbow and this person does, you know, gets stuck with a sword and this one gets stabbed 50 times, just like boom, boom, boom. And you don't have any moment to pause, you're just like taking it in, like just, it's it's just overwhelming, you're almost kind of like drowning in, in the violence, which is kind of the point of that. Uh, so the, the way in which you take these things in whether it's a comic, whether it's a novel, and then something that's either animated or, or, or a regular film um, or TV show, like you're kind of at the behest of like what the director wants you to feel rather than you sort of opening up that world kind of on your own. Um, so I like that this particular um, comparison touches on that issue. Let's go to... Oh, yes, so our last surprise one is um and this one i was asked permission for this um was attack on titan and uh this person uh <laughs> tried to write without spoilers thanks thanks i've seen it so i don't it's fine um let's see Where one two three four five okay this is a little bit of a longer thing but uh it's good the story itself comes across to me well in both formats, but I will always prefer the animated version because I am an animator and a voice actor. How the characters move throughout the series is a very important factor um, in better understanding their personalities. Small movements like a character fidgeting out of nervous, excuse me, nervousness is hard to tell in manga versus animated versions. Their body language is better shown animated, and we can also get a better and closer look at all the scenes because they are not limited to a page. I also think that movement in general is more important uh, in Attack on Titan than other enemies because the show is packed with action and based on fighting. Uh, we get to see speed, strength, the pain of actions more directly. Uh, it's more effective to look at that than try to interpret from a still image. Uh, it can also get more confusing in the manga because of a, a sketchy effect that, that this person was talking about earlier in uh, their responses. Uh, it's a great way to show movement, but it gets hard to tell what exactly is happening or which character is punching whom if they are both in a zoomed out panel. Um, I appreciate how much detail they add in each scene uh, with nothing but black and white and shades of gray. Um, let's see what else. Uh, the animated series has the same opening with each season or half season, and I love all the openings. Uh, it gives us a sneak piece, peek into the whole series, but of course... Uh, it's all a big mystery, and it's a great tactic to get the audience interested in, in the season itself. Uh, love the music, action-packed scenes, the whole aesthetic. So, uh, again, talking about the, there's there's some limitations. This the student is talking about the limitations of what happens in the manga, where it can be opened up a lot more uh, in the animated series. Where, uh, and it's true in Attack on Titan, a lot of the uh, fighting sequences with the with the titans, with the giants and stuff are, are, are really uh, action-packed. There's a lot of, of intercutting, um, really quick movements. Uh, you really get a great sense of speed. Um, and, you know, in a, a 2D form on the page, you can only kind of suggest that. And I suppose it, it might read better in animated form. So that's great. So that was... Um, all the responses for this week, and I really appreciate everybody's responses. They were all very uh, entertaining to read. And uh, 
very engaged. I mean, I, I, I really can read the excitement with which you're, you're engaging in these things. And I hope to um, finish up the rest of the semester with just more exciting things that you can do. And that's why um, today I wanted to get to something that I felt was also going to be exciting for you. But first thing I want to do is I just thought of something with regard to uh, this, you know, incredible piece of animation um, into the Spider-Verse. And you can, so if you look at just this one big splash sort of movie-sized um, still here of uh, Miles swinging through the city, excuse me, next to an elevated subway train, if you look in the margins and stuff, and you've seen this in the film, if you've seen the film, you definitely notice this. You see the dots, right, in the background here. So these dots, if you don't know already, if you're a comic person, you probably do know, they were called Ben Day dots. They were a form of, of printing that actually developed at the end of the 19th century, um, where it was like a screen pass. There was a combination of colors and dots that uh, created shading and could create color. And the genius of Into the Spider-Verse, where they kind of created that, uh, effect they added that effect into uh, the CGI type animation to really immerse itself back into comics. They spent a lot of time, as you could probably tell from the film, really trying to figure out how to get that comic feel back into it and yet still use CGI at the same time. Um, there's a lot of, of CGI uh, in order to create more movie-like effects, for lack of a better term. There's like motion blur when a character like this is like ostensibly swinging through the streets of New York City. Um, they use motion blur to make it look like as if it were film. They don't actually do that in Into the Spider-Verse because it looks more comic-like. It doesn't look so much like a film. Some people were a little weirded out by it at first visually. They were like, it seems really like staccato, some of the movements sometimes, and I'm not quite getting it. But that was actually the point. So it was a risk, but it really added to something very, very unique to the visuals. And of course, there were all the different characters that had unique visuals, like um, you know, Spider Ham had the like the the super two D and had the big thick holding lines, and then the noir Spider Man, you know, looked like he was all in chiaroscuro all the time and, and black and white. So here's an example of <laughs> a really hilarious example, I suppose of uh, the Ben Day dots in action in a, in a really old Silver Age Batman DC comic. You can see where, uh, you know, the... So it was a CMYK process. So cyan, uh, yellow, magenta, and uh, black. You can see here that uh, in order to create this gray for Batman's uh, uniform, it's basically a... a kind of a close staggering of the magenta and cyan dots over a white field. And so from a distance, or if you squint, it turns down gray. And then for the flesh tone, it's a certain spaced out um, magenta tone. Uh, you know, this bunched up cyan and a bunched up magenta creates like a, you know, kind of a purpley tone and then a blue tone here. And then you have your yellow. And you can actually see where you can make red because the doubled up magenta tone for the mass tone background bleeds because of the terrible register. You can see the off register here um, with the purple here and also with this red you can see the blending creates a red. The Robin's vest is red. His cape is supposed to be yellow but we have that bleed and now we can actually see what these dots do when they start uh, crossing into each other when the offset gets messed up. And Batman's teeth are flesh tone. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Anyway, um, I have this interesting theory that one of the things that's focused on in Into the Spider-Verse is the dots, as you saw in that big splash page of uh, Miles swinging through the city. But there's also more dots that occur later, which are based on Kirby dots. Now, Jack Kirby, as I might have mentioned, and those of you who were in my illustration survey class heard me talk about him, was a huge factor in the Silver Age uh, comics in DC and Marvel, too. Um, and he actually went on to develop a more independent label with somebody else called Pacific Comics, um, where they had, uh, Captain Ranger, what, I don't even remember the name of the title, uh, but it was, it was a bit over the top, and this was in his later years, so 
I think he was going a little crazy because some of his concepts were just totally out there. So this isn't actually a being. It's like a, it's like a center for like these space rangers that live inside this brain, which is inside a hand, which also has an eye on it. Don't ask. Don't ask. I looked it up, and I was like, okay, this is bizarre. Anyway, look at you see all the dots everywhere, right? All these like energy dots, exploding things, black tones, like just it was a Kirby thing. Like I don't even know what these ones are supposed to be over here, but they're also called uh, it's also called the Kirby Crackle when it's like an energy thing and you see these dots. I don't like the term Kirby Crackle so much as it sounds a little too much like it would be peanut brittle, like a black dotty peanut brittle or something like that. Um, so I'd like to use the term Kirby dots and it's sort of it, it jibes with my idea of of the Benday dots, both when both of these things are utilized similar for similar reasons in um, into the Spider Verse, because when uh, if you've seen the film, you know that there's like this particle collider that the Kingpin has, and it's sort of you know ripping through time, and that's why all the other different uh, Spider person iterations appear. And as the collider starts to malfunction and things start kind of tearing apart at the seams, we see things that are like Kirby dots, but we also see the Bende dots too. So for me, if the okay, this is this is my theory. So just bear with me here. So for me, if the Bende dots are sort of a foundational like tonal principle within the quote unquote normal world of Miles Morales, at like the beginning of the film, uh, before the collider starts doing its thing. Then when the collider starts ripping apart the nature of reality, the fabric of reality, it starts to appear as disembodied and, and disjointed uh, Kirby dots. So it's basically like the Ben Day dots sort of becoming this kind of particle energy and then sort of flying apart at the seams, creating all of this like crazy psychedelia. So this, this is not provable. This is my theory, and I came up with it only a little while ago just thinking about this. Um, so it's like a, the reason I bring this up is because it's this amazing combination of a formal process bleeding directly into a narrative process. So like the dots in both the Bende dots and the Kirby dots sort of represent a kind of energy and reality in this particular film that when shown in different ways, in different styles, it sort of represents exactly what's kind of going on in the moment. So... I think that's pretty amazing. Like, and that's I think why this film works on like so many different levels. So, <laughs> I know that sounds like I'm going a little bit stir crazy, and I'm like thinking too much about it. But you gotta admit, it makes a little bit of sense. You know, it's a film that's trying to look like a traditional comic, that's you know paying homage to traditional comics, yet is existing thematically and sort of. Uh, its own universe in a very modern technological way in the way in which it was built and also told it had the, the ability of the technology to be able to actually do this stuff so you know from a visual narrative perspective I think this kind of holds a lot of weight so um, tell your friends tell your friends about my theory see what they think I don't know okay <laughs> um, so back to this so um, this being uh, your discussion assignment for the week. So, trying to go back to the whole idea of like children's thematics. Now, I know that Pixar is sort of for children, but also you can watch it as adults and certainly appreciate the heck out of it because it's just amazing work. And uh, some of the themes can be very universal and very heartwarming and, you know, really wholesome and great. So, and I think we all know this, uh, but uh, I think. You know, Disney being originally sort of a, a children's-based kind of uh, production company, some of the earlier Pixar stuff was directed towards that. So what I want to focus on in terms of discussion is the short films. So I chose, uh, well, a bunch of them, almost all of them. What I want you to do is sort of look at some of the old ones and then some of the, and, and some of the new ones. Maybe like just one and one You can do the one-to-one -one comparison. Uh, the reason being is kind of what I've been talking about, like this whole lecture in the sense of that the the better that the, the technology is there to sort of like tell the story, 
the better the story becomes. So the quality of animation is more of a marker to drive the story than when the animation was at its most primitive. In this case, it's mostly CGI. So I'm going to list a bunch of shorts here. And I'm going to, in the announcements, I'll give you some links. You can find almost all of these on Disney Plus if you've got Disney Plus. Um, but if you don't have Disney Plus, there's a lot of resources on YouTube where you can find them too. And I'll give you a, a, a one or two compilations of them. Um, but here we have the classic Luxo Jr. This is one of the first ones ever. This is 1986. So the lamp that you see bouncing around on the ball at the beginning of every Pixar film is Luxo Jr. Um, I know from my friend working at Pixar that there's a giant Luxo Jr. and a ball like right in the parking lot as you enter the building. Um, he's a triathlete, so he always like parks his bike against the ball and takes pictures of it and sends them to me. Um, and because it, it's always beautiful in California, so he sends them to me in like the middle of February, and I'm just like, dude, that's really wrong of you. Um, so anyway, so we have Luxo Jr. 1986. I'll just throw it up there. There you go. Tin toy. 1988. Well, this is a good one to watch just because of the baby. <laughs> you just, if you haven't seen it or you've uh, seen it and you don't want to think about the baby ever again, just see it again. Just expose yourself to the horror of how they tried to animate humans back then. You can sort of do a little bit of this um, with Toy Story 1 versus like Toy Story 3 or 4 in terms of the way the humans are animated in, in those films and the quality there. But those are very, very long forms, so they're a little, they're a little bit um, different in terms of the storytelling aspect. Knickknack, which... Uh, very, very interesting thing about Knickknack, so that is, this is 1989, where I put an asterisk next to that because they redid it for uh, Finding Nemo because there are uh, some... There's a, a like a woman by the pool in, in the Miami knickknack, and then there's a mermaid at the end, and they have like incredibly huge, oversized boobs um, that they completely removed when they uh, showed it in front of Finding Nemo. So it's kind of an interesting thing on Pixar's part. Uh, Jerry's Game, which now we're jumping ahead to 1997, so you already notice that there's more ambition uh, in the quality of animation, especially in a, a human form. So, you know, we jump from 1989 to 1997. So I tried to survey stuff from each decade, but there's not a lot in the 90s. We have uh, year 2000 uh, for the birds. I think this is shown in front of Monsters, Inc., if I'm not mistaken. Um, and Bounden. Um, the voice of Bud Lucky for the Jackalope, or, yeah, uh, 2003, so it's the early 2000s, um, and then Lifted, which is uh, 2006, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. So uh, that's, now we kind of take a break, sort of think about like a definitive like page break here, now we'll jump ahead an entire decade. This will jump ahead for me to uh, Piper, which is 2016. Little Sandpiper dude, so cute. Um, this one isn't quite as well known, but it's it's fantastic uh, on so many different levels. Um, and you can just look at this still frame here, the short depth of field, the detail and the feathers. Just it's different, right? Um, yeah. And uh, this next one, big award winner, uh, Bow. Man, if this doesn't kick you right in the feels, I don't know what will. Um, but absolutely fantastic, and it's it's basically like this one giant uh, metaphor, uh, the whole thing. Wonderfully done. Um, so that was 2018, right? And then uh, this one, and, and the one right after this, uh, this is like the Pixar Spark Shorts thing, where it's a slightly longer uh, film time, but... Sorry, I'm drinking my coffee again. I don't want that to necessarily interfere too much with your analysis here because, yes, okay, you could say, well, if it's double the length, you can tell more of a story, but it's not necessarily the point. You could probably see when you when you see these that the, the quality of the animation and the CGI 
really contributes to the storytelling really no matter how long the piece is uh, and another spark short um, another more recent one from 2019 is one of my personal favorites because I own a pit bull called Kit Bull and um, as you can see from this now this isn't this is really I mean it's digital but it's not CGI it's not this fully rendered thing it's trying to harken back to uh, original cell type animation um, in terms of its style so we've actually gone like a, into like a bit of a retro zone here um, but the quality and stylization of this um, you know and how the story is told here is kind of a factor uh, in well, will be a factor in your analysis so I'm gonna put these all on a list for you so I'm going from 1986 to 2019 with let's see how many one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven short films from Pixar and so I want you to take some of the early era ones or one of the early era ones and compare it to a later era one and talk about um, how the visuals drive the narratives differently uh, what's in what's inside the narrative that may be present in one and that's not present in another? Uh, what can what is the ability of one versus the other in terms of being able to convey uh, narrativity and uh, engagement and plot and all those kinds of things? I'll, of course, I'll write this all out for you, but uh, I think that should be uh, fun for everybody. So again, you know, I wanted like a fun thing to engage in, like the previous one. Uh, so this should be uh, entertaining on one hand, but you know, in things that you may have seen already, maybe a few times, but I'm going to be asking you to look for specific things like I did with Jaws, so when you're engaged in a very specific way with this stuff, I think you tend to get even more out of it when you really start focusing and dialing in on um, certain aspects of, of the story and the visuals and how they move together. All right. So look for all that stuff in the announcements, and I will talk to you real soon. Hope everyone's doing well. Hope uh, spring manifests itself. Speaking of manifesting, it's just like it's blowing a gale out there, as they say here in Maine. I uh, hope that clears up soon, and I hope everyone's able to get outside, get some good vitamin D, because we all need it. All right, so in the meantime, I will do my best to get some more cool stuff together, and I'll talk to you real soon. Take care.